we begin our service with prayer. O Lord, our maker, redeemer, and comforter, we look forward to this holy season of Lent with sorrow and with fear, with awe and wonder. As we consider your suffering and death, make us to see that our own sins are the cause of it all. Lead us to genuine sorrow and repentance. Lead us also to see your incredible love for us and marvel at your willing sacrifice so that we might worship and praise you from our whole heart. We ask that you would hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. rise. This morning we will be following the order of service on page 12 and following in the worship supplement. This morning is Quinquagesima Sunday, which tells us that we are about 50 days away from Easter. We come to the end of our study of the commandments with the ninth and the tenth commandments today as the Lord seeks to teach us contentment to tr truly put our, our trust and our confidence in the Lord to provide for all of our needs. We begin our worship service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and to serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserved only His wrath and punishment. 
Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and the innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May the Lord give us strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, we ask you to hear with favor the prayers of your people. Having set us free from the bonds of sin by the perfect life and the innocent death of your dear Son, defend us now from all evil and equip us with the power of your word to remain faithful even unto death. For you live and reign with your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading for this weekend, as we meditate on the ninth and the tenth commandments and two contrasting words, covet and content, we see that the Apostle Paul talks about the wonderful God-given blessing of contentment. We read from 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 
I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things and before Christ Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Our gospel reading is found recorded in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. This is Jesus responding to a man who came to him, and Jesus again deals with contentment and covetousness. We read from the Gospel of Luke. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Here ends our gospel reading. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. We join to make confession of our faith in that God who does supply all of our needs. We will be using the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 15 in the worship supplement. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with the singing of hymn 789.
Please rise. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word of God which we are meditating on this weekend is found recorded for us in Joshua chapter 7, verses 20 through 26. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent, with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still there to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. This is the word of our God. You may be seated. In the name of our Savior Jesus, who is the one who gives us true contentment, your fellow redeemed. Over the last few months, we have been meditating on the Ten Commandments, God's revealed will to all human beings. We've taken a look at a variety of different commandments throughout this period. We've looked deeper into each one of them in order to see that what is on the surface isn't all that God intends for us to know when it comes to these commandments. The ninth and 10th commandments, which we're covering this week, deal with contentment on the positive side and what we call coveting on the negative side. Now, there are many wonderful examples of biblical accounts in the scripture that help us to illustrate certain biblical truths. We have one of those that we're meditating on today, a Bible story, an account that illustrates the danger of coveting, and in which the Lord teaches us true contentment. Before we jump into the text itself, it's probably helpful to get a little bit of background information to know where this account is in the history of God's Old Testament people. Moses has died. The reins of leadership have been turned over to Joshua. Joshua has led the children of Israel into the promised land over the Jordan River, and he is, the Lord has promised to give the land of Canaan into the hands of his people. Now, the first city that they come to as they enter into Canaan is the great city of Jericho. Well, God gave very specific details about how the children of Israel were going to conquer the city of Jericho. Nothing done by them. They were going to march around the city for seven days, and finally the Lord would bring the walls of Jericho down. This would demonstrate that this wasn't about them, This was about God delivering this powerful land into their hands. Before they conquered Jericho, the the Lord had given very, very specific directions. He said, I'm going to give this city into your hands. You're going to go in. You're going to conquer it after I bring the walls down. But you are not to touch any of the spoils. The silver and the gold, all of the metals, those would be gathered together, but they would be used for the Lord. Those would be the Lord's to demonstrate he was the one who had given this city into their hands. So 
we're told that after the walls of Jericho fell down and the children of Israel had a great victory, that the children of Israel then sent a very small contingent of individuals to the next town down the road, the little town of Ai. We're told that the people of Ai turned Israel on its heels, killed some of their men, but they rebutted the attack. It's here that our account picks up, where Joshua turns to the Lord, asking the Lord, what has happened? You delivered this great city into our hands, but we can't defeat this tiny little town just down the road. Why is the Lord not with us? And so the Lord then reveals something that took place in the conquering of Jericho, that this man, Achan, had stolen something that was dedicated to the Lord as his own. And the Lord uses this in order to teach us, too, a lesson on contentment in what is called the Valley of Achan or the Valley of Trouble. We pray that the Lord would help us as we meditate on this account in order to, first of all, see the dangerous root of every sin. And then finally also to see the devastating consequence of our sin. The first commandment, the ninth and tenth commandments, sort of serve as bookends. Think about your books on your shelves and how two things hold those books up in the middle. The first commandment, the ninth and the tenth commandments, really hold up all of the commandments in the middle. The first commandment deals with idolatry, trusting in something other than God. And the ninth and the tenth commandments take us back to that first commandment and remind us that coveting, in essence, is placing our trust in something other than God. We're right back to idolatry once again in the ninth and tenth commandments. These two bookends the ninth and 10th and the first, they hold all of the other commandments together. They help us to realize that breaking any of those commandments in the middle ultimately goes back to not trusting in the Lord, not being content. It shows us where all sin ultimately begins. The opposite of being content would be being discontent, not satisfied. If you think about it, we might question these two commandments that come at the end. From a human perspective, coveting just doesn't seem as bad as all of the other commandments that we've meditated on. After all, we're not hurting anybody when we simply covet something that isn't ours, or at least we don't have to. In the verses of our text, I want you to notice what Achan says in our text. Verse 21. Achan says, When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. Achan admits that he had a desire for something that he knew wasn't his. It wasn't supposed to be his. But he desired those things, and his desire got the best of him, and he took them. Well, what is it that motivated Achan to do this? This is what the ninth and 10th commandments are all about. It began by not putting God first. Those things were devoted to the Lord because he was the one who had delivered Jericho into their hands. But Achan said, no, you know, I deserve a portion of this. I played a role in conquering Jericho. I'm going to keep this for myself. It started with not putting God first and not being content with what God had actually given to him, wanting more than what God had given. The definition for coveting, we have to be careful with the word covet because sometimes we say, well, coveting is wanting something that we don't already have. Well, that's not exactly true. Coveting is a sinful desire for something that we don't already have. Something that God hasn't given to us. And ultimately, coveting is rooted in a selfishness, in a desire, me first, God second, and everybody else second. Now, there are many arguments that we might use throughout our lives in order to excuse our sin. One of those that we might use of our own or we might hear others use is that I didn't hurt anybody. 
Achan could have used this excuse, couldn't he? He went in and he was helping his fellow comrades defeat the city of Jericho. And as they gathered up all of the spoils, nobody was going to use it. Nobody was going to miss it. What's the problem with taking a little bit of gold, a little bit of silver, and just one Babylonian garment? That's not going to hurt anybody. It's not going to break anybody's bank. It's nobody else's. What's the big deal? Well, listen to what the Lord said through Joshua in the previous chapter. And you, that is the nation of Israel, by all means abstain from the accursed things. In other words, these things that God has forbidden, don't touch them. Lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold, the vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Sure, Achan didn't hurt anybody. But he disobeyed what God had revealed, that those things that he desired and took weren't for him. They were for God. And Achan knew that what he had done was wrong. You know why we know that he knew that what he had done was wrong? Because when he took the silver and the gold and he took the Babylonian garment, he hid it. He tells us that he took those things, he coveted them, and there they are, in verse 21, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. And so Joshua tells us, Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver under it. Achan knew what he had done was wrong, which is why he hid it. He knew that what he had done was something that was disobedience to God. In fact, he confesses that in the opening verse of our text. When Joshua confronts Achan, he says, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. Sin begins in the heart. That's where it starts. There's those bookends of not putting your trust, your confidence, ultimately in the Lord. It begins with selfishness, with disregarding God's word. Achan could have said, I don't understand it. I don't know why God would make this rule. It doesn't make any sense. But he still didn't have the right to do what he wanted and to disregard what God had said. The real dangerous root of every sin, which is highlighted through the ninth and the 10th commandments, is our wanting something for ourselves that either we should give to God or which we should give to others. This is the root of sin for each one of us, not just for Achan. But what about the consequences? There are also devastating consequences for sin. Again, we might say, you know, what's the big deal? Why make such a big deal out of this little piece of gold and this little piece of silver and one Babylonian garment? Why not just let him have it? These seem like pretty severe consequences. Being stoned to death because he had taken this small amount. We might say, well, why would God make such ridiculous rules? Look what happens. People die when God is so extreme in his nature. Why can't I just do what I want and take what I want when I want? Well, the Lord is trying to teach not just Achan, and not just the children of Israel, but he's trying to teach all humanity a lesson here in these verses. Remember that Jericho fell in the way that it did in order to demonstrate that the Lord was the one who was going to give them this land. He was the one whose power would conquer the land of Canaan. It didn't have anything to do with the children of Israel. The Lord was going to bring this about. But the Lord also knows that as they enter into this land that is full of powerful cities and a great deal of wealth, that his people were going to face many, many temptations and desires as they entered this land. And those temptations and those desires would have the tendency to lead them not to trust in the Lord, but to trust in the wealth, the prosperity that they then had conquered by their own hands. 
So what is the Lord doing here? The Lord is desiring to teach the children of Israel contentment. Achan's sin brought trouble on Israel. Verse 25 of our text near the end, Joshua says, why have you troubled us? In fact, that valley, this place where this all took place, the valley of Achor, literally means the valley of trouble. They named it after this event. What took place here? Why have you troubled us, Joshua asked. Well, you might say, well, what was the trouble? What was the big deal? Well, remember, the children of Israel went to attack Ai. And they were repulsed. They were sent away. 36 men, not a large number, but 36 men of Israel died in that attack as a result of what Achan did. They troubled, this troubled Israel as a whole. The Lord was not with them because they had not made God the priority. We're back to idolatry. The community of Israel as a whole suffered as a result of Achan's rebellion against God. We might call this guilt by association. The nation itself suffered as a result of Achan's sin. And this is a reminder that our sins, even though they might not seem big in our own minds, they impact other people around us. Sin has a consequence. And that consequence, which goes all the way back to Genesis, is death. We're told in the verses of our text, halfway through verse 25, so all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. They raised over him a great heap of stones still there to this day. Sin has consequences. Now, we might look at that account and we might say, well, that was really severe. That was unnecessary. And yet God said it is very necessary. As a result of any little sin that we might carry out in our own lives, the result, the consequence of that sin, no matter how small, is always death. That's the consequence. Sin is dangerous, and God is just. And so sin must be dealt with justly. If it doesn't, if it isn't, the Bible tells us that it just spreads. The Bible describes false teaching. It describes sin as a cancer, as gangrene that continues to spread and infect those around but look at the consequence, the result. When they stoned Achan and his family, we're told in verse 26 near the end that the Lord turned away from the fierceness of his anger. As a result of the justice being served, the Lord turns away from his anger. Now these verses point us ultimately to Jesus. What Joshua is describing here in these verses isn't the fact that Achan paid for his sins. Yes, that's true in an earthly sense. But when the Lord turned away from the fierceness of his anger, we're pointed ultimately to Jesus, the one who came and suffered the punishment of the debt of our sin for us in our place. As we move into Lent here this week on Wednesday, that's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at the cross of Christ to see that it was there at the cross of Calvary where Jesus suffered the punishment for all of the sins of all of the world. Achan, as well as each one of us. That debt of sin has been paid in full. God has poured out the fierceness of his anger upon Jesus there at Calvary. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. What happens to Achan here does point us ahead to the ultimate security that we have as children of God. The fact that Christ has paid the debt of our sin, that he has suffered death in our place. Here's the point. Paul says, if God has done that for us, if he was willing to send his own son to suffer the punishment of our sins and die on the cross in order to redeem us to himself, 
if God was willing to sacrifice that greatest treasure for us, then what won't he give for us? What won't he do for us? If God is for us, who can be against us? The Lord teaches not only Israel, but he teaches each one of us contentment here in the valley of trouble. He points us to Jesus, the one who has endured all of our sins, who has paid the debt of our sin, and he teaches us true contentment, knowing that if God does that, placing all of our sin upon Jesus, who died in order to set us free, then he will certainly provide for all of the needs that we have both in this life and in the life to come. We're back to the bookends. The fact that it is God and what God has done and accomplished for us in Jesus that leads us to place our confidence and our trust in him, both putting him first, the first commandment, but also being content and knowing that God will give us all the things that we need, that we can trust in him. We see that, yes, there, there is something that is a root of all sin, and that is covetousness, and it is dangerous. We also see that death is the devastating consequence of our sin. But we see that Jesus, through his death on the cross, has paid that debt for each one of us. He has suffered the consequence of sin in our place. And it is faith in Jesus that leads us then as Christians to be content, to trust in God above all things and to know that he will provide for all of our needs. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Please rise for prayer. O Lord God, whose ways are mercy and truth to all who come before you with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, let your peace fall upon all who have come this day into your house to offer you the sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. Because of your mercy in Christ, pardon our iniquity. Do not remember the sins of our youth, but in your great mercy, look upon our desperate need and forgive us. Restore our souls. Lead us in your truth. Teach us your way and be gracious to us. Bring us safely out of all our distresses. Dear Lord, bring divine light to our souls that we and all people might see in you all the treasures of heavenly wisdom and knowledge. Teach us to pray and give us such a measure of faith that we may put our full trust in your power, goodness, and love. O Holy Spirit, who is the Lord and giver of all life, enlighten our understanding of God's word. Teach us of the great love with which Christ has loved us and guide us so that we may walk in his light, honoring our Lord with all of our thoughts, words, and deeds. O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in whom we live and move and have our being, bless this house that it may be continually a place where your honor and glory dwells, where your name is praised and where your truth is proclaimed. Bless also our homes, that they might be rooted and grounded in love and every good work. Help all those among us who might be enduring any kind of affliction, trial, or adversity, and reveal the exceeding greatness of your power to all those who believe. O Lord, grant your almighty help to those who are hungry, to those who are homeless, to those who are oppressed or imprisoned throughout the world. Move also your believers to go forth to all the nations, preaching the gospel of Christ crucified with courage and boldness from your Holy Spirit and showing forth works of love and compassion for your glory. Now to him who has redeemed us, whose teaching we confess and whom we shall one day see face to face, even to Jesus Christ, be honor and glory forever. It is in his name that we ask this and in his name in which we also join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Receive with believing hearts the blessing and the promise of our triune God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <coughs> Please be seated. We'll conclude with the singing of hymn 382.